Good evening, everybody. I'm Kiana Faircloth, host of Afternoon Jazz on WBGO and The Pulse. Welcome to another special edition of The Pulse. Each edition is special, but tonight I have the Grammy-nominated drummer. He's a, gosh, band leader, songwriter, just an extraordinary guy. Nate Smith, you might have heard of him. He's got a brand new album. It's called Kinfolk 2, See the Birds, and he joins me right here on The Pulse. Welcome to The Pulse, Nate. Hi, Kiana. How you doing? <laughs> Great. How are you? I'm so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with Man. you. Chesapeake's own. <laughs> Chesapeake's own. That's right. Live and direct from Chesapeake. You know it. You know it. You know, anybody from that area, I feel yes. like, is a hometown guy. Of course, yes. I'm from D.C. Okay. So I, I, I feel a special sort of Southern yes. connection. Yes. Yes. It's, it's called the DMV for a reason. You know, it's right. kind of all one big state, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm VA through and through. VA through and through, man. But you have, of course, you know, taken your talents globally at this point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the folks that you've worked with alone, I mean, God, Pat Metheny, Robbie Coltrane, mm -hmm. uh, Wolfpack, Brittany Howard, so many, so many folks across varying genres. Right. You know, it seems right. like you're your work it just knows no bounds it seems yeah it, uh, i've been lucky in that most of the people who have um contacted me to work together have made space for me and for my musical personality you know hmm. um that's one of the things that i have i feel like learned from the best band leaders i've worked with is if you call someone for a gig make space for them you know make space for everything they bring their, whatever their personality is, like make space for it in the music. Hmm. So with all the people you mentioned from, from Brittany to Wolf to Ravi, you know, um, to Pat, you know, they, they all called me with a specific thing in mind hmm. that, I, that I had. And so I feel lucky that they, they made that space for me to be myself in those different contexts, you know. I'm curious to know, like, how have you been able when did you know that you had a particular sound and how have you been able to hone that sound that is signature mm -hmm. to you? I know that's a broad sort of question. Yeah, it, you know, New York City taught me a lot, you know. Um, New York City, you know, when you're a working musician in New York, the people who call you, who are interested in the thing you do, they teach you a lot about how you sound, you know? And so the collaborations that you, you kind of jump into, you'll play something and that band leader will be like, yeah, that, that, you know, do, do that, that thing. I like that thing that you, that the, the way you approach, you know, playing straight eighth notes or the way you approach, you know, playing a groove or the way you approach dynamics, Th they can kind of point out the thing. And if you, if that's sort of a common denominator, uh, you know, across different collaborators, then you can think to yourself, okay, well, maybe that's, maybe I'm onto something. Maybe yeah. I, there's something about the way I do it that appeals to these very different musicians, but it's common to me, you know? Um, so you're so, saying you didn't notice it yourself as other folks that pointed it out to you. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the collaborative yeah. process taught me as much about my sound um, as it taught me about the musicians I was working with. You know, it's just, it, you learn by doing, by trying and failing or trying and succeeding, you know, you, you learn from both. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like just all of the different, one of the beautiful things about being in New York was that, you know, there are so many different musicians. There's a concentration of so many great musicians. So, you know, you go from playing with Ravi Coltrane one day to <laughs> playing with Somi the next day right. to playing with Nir Felder, you know, the next week. Um, and, you know, but what's the thing that all of those artists like about my playing? Well, when I would sit down and play, it was like, okay, well, the groove feels really good or the dynamics feel really good. Or I like the way that you can, you know, sort of bring drama to the music. These are all the lessons I learned from them, you hmm. know? Yeah. So you have, you know, found great success in working with, you know, all of these amazing, phenomenal musicians across genres. Most recently, 
I saw you at Brick Jazz Fest uh, yeah. with Van Hunt. Van Hunt. You guys have an amazing duo going. I'm curious to know how did that even come about? So uh, Van, I reached out to Van on Twitter. Oh, Our wow. relationship began on Twitter. I tweeted, I want to make a record with at Van Hunt, right? And just threw it out there and didn't know what was going to happen. And just shot replied, shot. And I shot my <laughs> shot. I shot my shot into the cyberverse, right? And Van replied. He was like, let's do it. And he spelled less with a whole lot of S's, like L-E-S-S-S. -S -S. And I was like, okay, I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I had been a fan of Vans, like most of us, I've been a fan of Vans since his, I first heard of his music. It actually wasn't his record. It was um, Rasan Patterson's second record oh called Love in Stereo, right? Now, see, now, now we're, now we're, now we're here. <laughs> oh my God. Right? So, yeah, yeah, Rasan. Oh yeah, Rasan Patterson. I mean, shout out to Rasan Patterson, who's, who I mm. think is mm. one of the greatest. Yeah. Um, but I remember reading the liner notes when that record came out and I saw Van Hunt, I saw this name and I was like, man, who is this funky German producer? Like I, I thought it was like some, some German dude <laughs> <laughs> making you know, these records. But I didn't know who he was, but I, I remember when his first record came out, um, I just played it constantly for like six months. And I was just, you know, just, just enamored with everything he did. And uh, so I've been a fan for a long time. And so I shot my shot on Twitter. This was 2017, I shot this shot. Um, okay. And we kept in touch over time. And I met him in the summer of 2018. Um, and in the summer of 2019, we did this. Um, well, actually, I think it was a little bit before that. We did this, this song together that was on this EP I put out in 2020 called Light and Shadow. And so we had this yeah. duo. Um, and so, and so it's, it's, we're continuing to write songs together, you know? Um, wow. and yeah, it's been, it's just been incredible. I've learned so much from, from working with him. I really It's have. always really interesting to hear about how other musicians just sort of, you know, have these musical crushes on other yeah. musicians. You're yeah. looking at the liner notes, as you yeah. said, lo and behold, I'm looking at the liner notes. I'm like, yeah. I didn't realize that you helped write having him wait. Yeah. For Michael yes. Jackson, I'm yeah. like, wait, is that? I'm like, no, nah, that name, Nate Smith. I'm like, no. hold it's, up. It's, <laughs> surely you jest. Uh, no, that was that was me. Wow, man. Yeah. yeah. Can we just? I, I want to talk about that for a yes. little bit. I want to know what that was even like. Okay. Putting so, that song on Michael Jackson. Let's, okay. So first of all, let me start with the 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 question that I get the most is, I never met him. I was never in the studio with Michael. Okay. So, so this record happened over the course of four years. I met, I was in, living in Richmond, Virginia. I made this beat, this track at my house and I um, put the track, I gave it to a friend who gave it to another guy who gave it to another guy who wrote lyrics to it. And then it became Heaven Can Wait, right? And so Heaven Can Wait ended up being played for Teddy Riley, the mm. great Teddy Riley. Yes. who was submitting songs to Michael for the Invincible album. And so uh, Michael heard Heaven Can Wait and he, you know, oh, I have to have it. I love it. Yeah, I don't know what he said, but <laughs> I'm it, just, right? I just always freestyle that part. And um, <laughs> so, th and this happens over the course of four years. So um, this is 1997 when I made the track and this is 2001 when it gets to Michael. So Michael records it. He goes to Miami. He records a song, I think, in Miami. And I start getting these phone calls from Teddy Riley's people saying, you know, Michael Jackson loves your song, you know, he wants to make the record. You know, it's like that kind of, and I didn't, you know, I thought it was a joke. I, it was like, Michael Jackson is gonna <laughs> sing, what? So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, lo and behold, it was real. And, you know, all the lawyers got on the phone and everybody slugged it out. And um, it became a, a, a real, song on a real Michael Jackson record. So I didn't know anything. This was May of 20, 2001. And so six months later, six, seven months later, I'm in New York. I have moved to New York. I lived in Virginia at the time. I've moved to New York. And it's October 30th or so, 
2001. I think we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of this record. Wow. Yeah. And, and so I go to HMV Records on 125th Street and I go up and I buy two copies of Heaven Can Wait and I open up the credits and there's my name as a rep. I mean, come on. Come on. It's just mind blown. Mind blowing. It actually happened. It actually happened. And, you know, the, the funniest part of that story, I kind of skipped the funny part, which is, you know, it was Michael Jackson. So it was very hush hush. It was all under wraps. They didn't send any advanced copies. I actually heard the song a week before the album came out and I bought it. I bought a bootleg copy of it on 125th Street from <laughs> this African brother who had a blanket and he had incense, shea butter, oils. <laughs> And bootleg CDs and DVDs, like. <laughs> right. You know so, you made it when you've been bootlegged. <laughs> that's, you know, you, you know it. it, you know you it. So it. I made it. I had arrived, so I bought it, took it home, and listened to it. But I didn't actually see the the finished product with the credits and everything until it came out. So, it's a uh, it's it's a really miraculous story and uh, one of the you know happiest accidents of of my career. You know. Man, that's yeah. incredible. That's an incredible story. And the fact that you wrote that at home, you hadn't even left your hometown. I hadn't. I hadn't. I was, yeah, I was still, you know, making beats in the, in the in the bedroom, you know, when I when I made uh, the track that would become that song, you know. So, um, yeah, it's it's just an, a really improbable sort of trajectory for that music to go from the bedroom to the, the king of pop, you know, it's, it's just huge. Wow. Yeah. And you went to school, was it James Madison? James Madison years? University. Yeah. Undergrad, I did James Madison. I did a year of graduate school at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I lived in Richmond for four years around that time. What was the scene like in in Virginia, in Richmond specifically? Because there is like a, a scene for yes. jazz. Yeah, there, there is. It's, um, I think it's becoming a little bit more of a centralized scene now. Um, it was kind of, when I was there back in the late nineties, it was kind of sort of a spread out scene. You know, you had cats who were playing down in Virginia beach. You had cats who were playing in Richmond. You had cats who were playing in Charlottesville, um, which is also a great music town. Um, but there wasn't like a centralized music scene. Richmond right now, I think has a much more centralized music scene um, than it did when I lived there. Um, I think that, you know, people are building things in Richmond, you know, Butcher Brown is, the, oh, yeah. the latest sort of um, hometown heroes coming out of Richmond and, and they really built their thing in Richmond. And um, there are a couple of great record labels there too. Space Bomb Records is down there and they're, they're just really cool stuff happening. Um, so some of it was about the jazz scene, but also, you know, there was also this like R&B kind of like instrumental R&B slash smooth jazz kind of scene that was popping down there too. And that was kind of where I started to sort of cut my teeth as a musician, a young musician mm -hmm. was playing down there with all those great musicians who you know, from the local scene and, and playing cover band gigs and wedding gigs and, you know, just, just paying the dues, you know? Yeah. Those, so yeah. you really have been like all over yeah. several different genres from the yeah. very beginning. What were you listening to as a youth growing a youth. up? Yeah. Um, so my the earliest stuff I can remember in the house was the stuff that my pop loved, which was the instrumental R and B seventies, eighties. So Grover, Jazz Crusaders, David Sanborn, uh, Quincy, Herbie, you know that stuff. And then as as I became a teenager and started to sort of develop my own relationship with music, I kind of discovered you know stuff that I liked that was on the radio. So I discovered the Police, and I discovered sting and I discovered Prince and I discovered, you know, and that was the stuff that was, but what I didn't realize living color was a big one for me when I discovered mm. them. Um, what I didn't realize was that so much of that music that I loved was heavily influenced by these guys were influenced by jazz musicians, you know? And so when I listened to, I discovered a tribe called quest and I was listening, oh, man, you know, who is this Ron Carter playing bass on this record? I don't, what, did, what is that? And it made me dig a little deeper to find out. And then I realized he was a giant, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? And so that was kind of my, those, those musicians were my pathway into jazz. It wasn't sort of a direct road. It was kind of going through the music that I liked and figuring out what made it special. Yeah. And yeah. 
Yeah. So how did you come upon Art Blakey? So Art Blakey, so how I discovered Art Blakey was actually through this documentary film um, about Sting called Bring On The Night. This was after he left the police. Ah. And he formed this band with Branford Marsalis on saxophone, Kenny Kirkland on, on piano, the late oh, Kenny right. Kirkland, Daryl Jones on bass, and Omar Hakim on drums. But um, I had known who Art Blakey was. I'd heard the name, but didn't know much. He kind of ex existed in the abstract. But there's a scene in that documentary where Branford talks about playing with Art Blakey. And I was like, okay, so yeah, what? Let me go find, let me go find some Art Blakey. And so, um, my dad had this uh, record called Album of the Year. I think it came out in the early 80s or so. It was like- it was like 81 or something 80, like that. Yeah, yeah. And it was like this big picture of like this like this French like bridge, this beautiful like skyline picture on the cover. And I remember hearing the first tune, which is In Case You Missed It, Bobby Watson tune. I just played that thing over and over and over and over and was just way into just art, how he played the press role and, and how the time was so so loose but how he was so dynamic and how tight the ensemble was i just i couldn't get enough of it so i was obsessed with that album um yeah, yeah I, I and that was my first like real straight ahead jazz album that i couldn't stop listening to so at that point i'm sure you like dove into yes. the entire jazz world at that point Absolutely. i don't know if you can see these records up here but oh okay where is it this one i, right, I can't here. see oh, oh wow yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. a killing one too. Absolutely. Uh, these are up here for you. Yes. This well, is, thank uh, you. Roy Haynes over Ooh. here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the master. Still doing it. Still killing them. I know, right? Still killing them. Incredible. Yes. So this latest album, you have Kinfolk 2, which is I feel like a continuation, of course, of the first Kinfolk album you put out. Mm -hmm. But Gosh, the collaborations you have on this record. Yeah. I'm like, first of all, I'm so glad you brought my friend Ama Watt back. Oh, come on. One time for Ama. Ama is, she's a core kinfolk family. <laughs> yes, absolutely. God, that voice. Yes. And then, yes. you know, people don't know that. I don't know. People might know this, but I have been a fan of Stokely. Yes. For as long as I can remember from yes. making dishes. So when I... Yeah. I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> Dave. Yes. Get Stokely on the track. Yeah. How did that happen? So, all right. Um, so to talk about that song, we got to go back to Ama because Ama wrote the lyrics to that song. I've been writing songs nice. with Ama since 2013, since we, oh, wow. we started the Kinfolk Project. Because I knew I wanted to write songs with lyrics. And there's something very special about Ama's lyrical approach. Like she's very eloquent but she's also, she can say things in a way that are very relatable to people. Um, and she just has an incredible ear for melody too. Mm. So I would bring sort of these like, you know, melodies and little changes to her. And I would say, so this is what I'm thinking. And she would turn it around so quickly and it would just be beautiful. And I'd be like, Alma, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, yeah, she, she just, she, yeah, the, the pen is, uh, in addition to being a great singer, she's just a fantastic writer. But um, so when I, I brought this song to her, and we started talking about the lyrics about, you know, um, the songs is called Don't Let Me Get Away. And this idea of like teenage heartbreak, you know, this idea that, um, yeah, you, you know, you're going to you're going to let me go now. You're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. Don't let me get away. I know you're yeah. scared. I know, you know. Um, so she, there's a version with her singing it. The first time we recorded it was with her. And then she had she and I had a conversation. She, she's like, you know, Nate, what if a male vocalist sang this? What 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 would it sound? And I thought, yeah, I mean, that would be incredible. Um, and, you know, I had a conversation with Deborah Bond, who you mentioned um, yes. you know, before we went on air. And it was actually her who she recommended Stokely. She was like, what about Stokely? And the light bulb went off. First of all, wow. Stokely's amazing. You know, yes. he's just, he's one of the greatest voices. Um, and he's also um, a huge inspiration to me as a drummer, he's an incredible yes. drummer. So it just seemed kind of like a cosmic thing. So it was the same thing. I shot my shot on Instagram this time. I hit him up. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I changed platforms. <laughs> I changed platforms this time. And so, I, <laughs> so I just, you know, I shot my shot in the DM. He replied, he's the nicest guy. Oh. He is the most humble cat. 
Wait, and, I gotta get this. Hold on. Yeah. Me and Stokely. Oh, look out. <laughs> look out. But I tell you, I'm a fan. I'm a huge fan. Oh, like, man. He's, he's, I'm not uh, playing. <laughs> oh, man. He's, he's, he's the greatest. He's the greatest. And so I sent the track to him. I sent the lyrics to him. And um, he turned it right around. This He was actually, Stokely and Brittany Howard were the last two guests that I approached for the record. And they, they you know, knocked it right out of the park. Uh, and he sent it right back to me and it was, and I listened back to it and it was the same feeling I had when I heard the, the Michael Jackson track. It was like, how did this happen? You know, this, mm -hmm. here's this guy I've been listening to since I was in high school and he's singing a song that, that I co-wrote with Amma and, you know, it's just amazing, but he knocked it out. He knocked it out. Yeah, he certainly did. Yes. Now, speaking of Brittany Howard, you have worked with her, of course, before. So, uh, when you asked her to be yeah. on your record, tell me about that. Yeah, it was um, it was around Grammy time earlier this year, and she was doing all this press, you know, leading up to the Grammy Awards, and she was nominated for a bunch of awards this year, so she was really busy. And it was right around the same time that I had to turn the album in. So I reached out to her and I said, okay, Brittany, I know it's a long shot. I've been nervous to ask you this, but I have this song that I'd like to dedicate to my dad, and I wondered if you would consider writing lyrics, you know. And she hit me back. She's like, okay, I got you. Send it to me. And so I sent it to her. She was like, oh, Nate, this is beautiful. And there's a really funny text thread between the two of us mm -hmm. about with the lyric, lyric ideas, you know. And of course, hers are way better than mine. <laughs> but but she just um again, she did it at home in her home studio in Nashville, um, turned it around in a couple of days. Um, and I think she just sings it so beautifully. And I haven't heard her sing like that on many other records you know we right we, yeah she's she's I like a rock ask, star I'm like wait who is that yeah and then i'm like oh my god that's yeah. britney <laughs> yeah 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 she's such a powerhouse vocalist but she also has this real like sort of vulnerable kind of beauty in her voice too so she just um man she 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 sang the heck out of it i don't want to curse on the the, the pulse but she sang she, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> she knocked it out it's she, all right yeah she knocked it out and um I'm just really, really uh, thrilled that she did it, you know? Yeah. You also have uh, so many just beautiful tracks and collaborations. You have Michael Mayo. Yeah. That's another one. One of my, yeah. one of the ones I, I really love yes. on the album as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I met Michael in 2013. He was a student at Betty Carter Jazz Ahead. Um, okay. And I was on the faculty that year. And uh, we were all blown away by Michael. You know, it's funny, the St. Michael and Jasmine Horn were students in the same year. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. So it was a whole lot of singing in that, that year at, oh, at Jazz yeah. Ahead. And, um, but we were all blown away with Michael, just this, the dexterity in his voice and, and just his ideas are so clear. And he's just, you know, a great, great young singer. And so I've been wanting to work with him. He actually appears on the first Kinfolk record, too. Um, but he's kind of appearing, just like doing like background vocals, sort of percussion stuff. But this record, I really wanted to feature him front and center because I feel mm -hmm. like Michael's, you know, he's about to blast off, you know. Yeah, he's, nice. he's great. Let's work backwards a little bit okay. here. I, I'm just curious. Um, See the Birds. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Like, tell me. Tell me about the title, even of the album, Kinfolk 2, See the Birds. Yeah. Um, so. I wanted to kind of take the the listeners of, the, of this record back to this moment in my life where I started to have this big dream about being a musician. You know, this this happened for me when I was about 14 or 15 years old, you know, and it, it really started to feel like it was something I could do. You know, um, I started to obsess over not only the records, but also the liner notes and where these records were recorded and, and I would watch all these videos of these people playing in these really far away places and I was like, man, I, I want to go there. I want to do that. You know, so to me, this idea of looking up and seeing the birds is like looking up at the dream that I had for myself oh, as it. a musician, you know. And um I also used to wonder, like I would look up and see, you know, I, I didn't get on my first airplane until I was maybe in my late teenage years, you know. And so I would look up and just, I would see all these planes flying. I'd be like, where's everybody going? You know, I want to go and see, you know, kind of what's out there, you know, like what's happening. Um, so it's kind of a, a sort of a hybrid of that. Like a lot of times in, in pop music or even gospel music, the bird kind of represents freedom. So this, this idea of 
seeing this bird looking up at this this dream of of musical freedom that's kind mm -hmm. of what i wanted to evoke with the title interesting i'm so glad i asked you that because it makes a lot of sense you know your music of course it seems and, and you've proven that it, it knows no bounds mm -hmm. honestly you across genres you're doing your thing and right now i just found out you told me you you're living in nashville now yeah yeah tell me about what you've been doing out there so I've been, uh, I moved to Nashville in July of 2020 um, when, you know, COVID kind of screeched everything to a halt, you know, everything stopped. Um, and it kind of became clear that being on the road wasn't going to be my main source of income anymore. So I, I, I felt like I had to pivot to the studio where I knew I could work, you know. And um, so Nashville has a fantastic recording scene. I've met a lot of really cool producers. Um, yeah. and musicians in Nashville. And, you know, obviously country reigns supreme in Nashville, but there's a lot of really cool music in Nashville. Um, it's not just country music. It's, there's a lot of contemporary gospel in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I did a, I played with Kirk Whalem for the first time. I, I met him and I was yeah. thrilled to play with him. Um, so there's, there's a lot of really cool music happening in Nashville. It's, it's an interesting scene and a very, and, and it's a town that's growing really quickly too. Yeah, so you've been able to keep going like basically nothing happened. Basically. Yeah, I mean, you know, moving is a big, you know, it's that's a big one. It's like packing up. I was in New York for 19 years and it was a very big decision to to leave. Sure. Um, but but I Your I decided right there. Wow. Oh yeah. Oh man. <laughs> huge, huge. And and New York was so good to me in every way, you know. Um New York taught me so much, you know, and it, and it just it really I took a lot of valuable lessons and it, it really made me a better musician because, you know, in New York, you're the, the best musicians are right there on the train next to you. And we're all trying to learn and get better, you know? Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's been, I've been blessed because it's been kind of a seamless transition from New York to Nashville. Um, I don't know if Nashville is the final destination, but it's been, uh, I've been very lucky for these last, um, mm -hmm. last year and a half or so. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you're deciding to move really is not unlike other musicians, yeah. you know, who have up and moved yeah. uh, during the pandemic. A lot of a lot of folks have moved to like L.A. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, Georgia and yeah. different places. You just yeah. kind of got to go where you can continue to create. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, COVID, um, it really kind of illuminated what was important for so many people. And, you know, we work really hard. But we also have to live too. You know, we have we have um, some some of us want to buy houses and spread out a little bit and have a little space and you know not live in the in the boxes that kind of right. New York can put us in. You know, um, so I, that that was another factor in the decision for me was like I wanted to just give myself a little room to stretch out and just kind of relax a little bit um, and and take a breath. You know, because. Uh, 2020 was a very stressful year for all of us. You know, it was a very stressful time. And we're still in, in it, too. We're not quite out of it yet. Right. How have you stretched out in other ways outside mm -hmm. of, of course, launching the new album and yeah. doing your studio sessions and things like that? Yeah. I've really been um, trying to write as much music as I, as I possibly can. You know, I, I bought myself a piano which was a very nice. big, that was a very big deal. You know, I'd been wanting one for a long time, but you know, I lived in a studio apartment for 13 years, so I didn't have space, right. <laughs> space for one. But um, so I've been really trying to, to um, challenge myself to create as much music as I can, you know, whether it, not thinking about so much where it's gonna go, just, just write, just mm. write, you know. And, and hopefully let everything else sort of work itself out. Um, but that's been the, the real thing. And I've also given myself a chance to rest for the first time in, you know, maybe 20 years. <laughs> you wow. know, I, I, I moved to New York and I hit the ground running and I was, you know, hustling for those 19 years and some great things happened. But I also realized and my body was telling me too, like, you know, you, you might need to slow down a little bit, take a, take a breath, you know, and, and just uh, reflect on why you're working so hard like what what's the why behind what you're doing you know mm, that's so important 
so many people have been saying just that. Yeah. You know, I actually got a chance to breathe, mm -hmm. musicians have been saying, and mm -hmm. the cre creativity that has, you know, come up out of me just by, you know, stopping for a yeah, minute. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. When you sit still and, and allow yourself to hear yourself think, you know, for a moment. Um, New York is a very noisy environment, you know, and it's it, there's always a distraction, you know. Um, so stepping out of it has really allowed me to, to kind of open up and just kind of see what's what else is in there, you know, and, and uh, document it as much as I can. You know? Yeah. So what's next for you? I know uh, right now you're in New York. What do you, I am. I was I was here for a recording session. Um, I did a, a, a short recording session a couple of days ago and I'm going to be starting a tour with Kurt Elling and uh, mm -hmm. Charlie Hunter. Yeah, that that begins um, this Sunday, I think. Oh, cool. For yeah, Super yeah. Blue. Super Blue, yeah. Yeah, and we'll, be, we'll actually be back at Brick for that, too. Um, oh, so nice. that'll be fun. And um, yeah, and so I'm going to do that for the next couple of weeks. And then, of course, um, after that, we've got a handful of Kinfolk shows. Cool. Um, our Hell first shows, yeah, as a full band since, uh, wow, since 2019, I don't think we've played as a full band. Wow. So it'll be uh, really, really exciting. We're going to be in New York on November 7th at LPR. Um, and we're very much looking forward to that show. Very much looking forward to it. Um, yeah, but they're, they're, we're, we're playing five shows starting on November 4th, Pembroke, Massachusetts, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, New York City, uh, Philly, and D.C. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so. And we can, of course, find that on your website. Absolutely. Batesmithmusic.com slash events. I think it's right. It's all listed there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We've got a couple comments here cool. and questions in the chat here let's okay. start with uh let's see here oh here's a question how did you i think you may have answered this partially but how did you get together with Brittany howard oh Brittany howard um i got a cold email from her manager in oh. 2018 spring of 2018 um her manager kevin morris uh hit me up and said hey you know would you be interested in coming out to LA to do some. Now, what they didn't know is that I'd been listening to Sound and Color for a year, oh like nonstop. God. And so I had to play it real cool. Like, cause <laughs> I was, I was fanning out, you know, on Britney. And when she actually hit me, I was like, oh, okay. So I had to be like, yeah, you know, I think I, you know, let me check my schedule out. I'm not sure. <laughs> I was like, right, let me, let me whole see. Whole time you're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the whole time I was just like, all right. My initial response was yes. But I had to, you know, you know, play it cool and shit. But um, so that was the beginning of it. And I went out to L.A. with her in the summer of 2018. We, we recorded for two weeks. Um, Glasper came out for a couple of days and we did one of the couple of the songs that are on the record with him. Uh, so that was the beginning. Yeah, that was the beginning of it. My first time meeting her and uh, working with her and just seeing how her creative mind works. She's she's great. Mm, mm. Here's another one. How did you connect with Jaleel Shaw? I met Jaleel, my man. I met Jaleel, it must have been 2005. It's a long time ago. We, I think Jaleel uh, subbed for a Dave Holland big band gig. Um, and he was, I think he was in for, I forget who he was in for, but he came in and he was so ready for the, the, the music and he just crushed it. And I remember hearing him play and I was like, man, He's got the fire. Betty Carter used to say that. It was like, man, you know, she, she would always talk about the fire, you know, when you hear a musician who has the fire, you know. And Jaleel has it, man. Jaleel has it. And, and I knew it from the minute I, I heard him. I was like, I've, I've got to play with this cat. Um, so I've known Jaleel a long time. My, furry ver my very first band leader gig in New York, with, way before Kinfolk, was 2011 at the 55 Bar, and Jaleel was on it. And so was Fima Efron. So they've been, you know, in the core from the beginning. Nice. Yeah. Uh, someone here says uh, they had a chance to join your side eye live at the Blue Note in Tokyo. Mm. Could you share your thoughts and experiences on playing with Pat Metheny and also um, your thoughts on Takuya Kuroda? Oh, wow. Oh, man. Well, first with Pat, um, 
you know, playing with Pat, it's, there's so much information in everything Pat does, you know, because he, number one, he's a, he is a musical genius. And, you know, he's also just one of the hardest working musicians yes. too. Like he- Prolific. He's pro really prolific. And, and so you just learn so much about um, discipline, playing with Pat, you know, you learn about, uh, I learned so much about putting a set together, playing with Pat, mm -hmm. because it, every set that you play with Pat, not only as a player, but as an audience member, it feels like an experience with Pat because he gives you so much music and there's such an arc, you know, a storytelling arc in the way he puts the set together. I, I took a lot of lessons away from that working with him. Um, and also he's just, you know, really a very, very cool dude. And one of the more approachable, you know, musicians, like I, I never hesitated when I had a question for Pat, you know, some, some musicians can be a little, you feel a little funny going to him, but, but Pat was really open. He was down to talk about stuff and, you know, um, and share his thoughts and opinions on things. But Takuya, um, I met Takuya during my time with Jose James. Um, and Takuya, one of my favorite records I've ever played on was his uh, Rising Sun album. Yes. Uh, that yeah, is such that a, a groovy record. And I just, I love his tunes. Um, I love his sound. Um, he's such a bluesy a player um, and so soulful too. You know, I just, I just, yeah. I really love Takuya, man. He's, he's, uh, he's a bad dude. Indeed. You've worked yeah. with so many just, gosh, incredible, incredible. Yeah. I've been very yeah. fortunate. I've been very fortunate. Indeed. What's next? What's next for you? What do you, what do you ultimately want to do? What, you know? Yeah. I ask everybody this, but I'm always yeah. curious because, you know, it's not always readily apparent. Like you can yeah. assume that somebody, oh, I want this amount of Grammys, I'm gonna do this yeah. and that. But but really you as a person, not just as a musician, what do you yeah. want um, to yeah. do? What do you want that, your mark to be? I, I you know, as uh, cliche as it sounds or corny as it might sound, I just really want to kind of get better at making music, you know? Um, Music is hard, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to think about, I, you know, it, talent is one thing, but, you know, working and getting better at what you do, that's something that I really, um, this stillness in, in the last couple of years has really made me focus on like, yo, what, what do I need to work on? Not only as a drummer, but also just as a composer, as a writer. Um, and also, you know, I, I'm, Starting to, um, I was kind of joking with a friend of mine, you know, like the idea of a next chapter for me, you know, personally in terms of like, you know, family and, and like slowing down a little bit. Um, that's very appealing to me now, you know, um, it's, it's kind of been sort of illuminated by this, this whole COVID struggle we've been in. It's like, man, you know, what you do isn't who you are, you know? Right. So um, I just, oh you know, yeah, that's you know, a word. That's, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> seriously, you know, and yeah, and this um, this life, this musician life, can make you conflate the two. Um, but you know, there's a whole universe of stuff that I still think about, like you know, like what's on the horizon for me personally in terms of family and, and stuff like that. You know, I, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm thinking about it in much more um, urgent terms than I've ever thought about it before, you know, so, um, and I hope that that has an effect on the music too. I hope the music reflects that, you know, um, so I'm just wanting to write as much as I can. I'm really excited about a couple of upcoming, the, this Van Hunt project. I'm really excited about that. Cool. Um, I want to write a lot more large ensemble music too. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some, there's a little few irons in the fire, I guess, you know. Nice. Yeah. Well, we can't wait to see What's next? Here's Matt Merowitz. He says, hey, Nate. Hey, Kiana. So thrilled for all of your success, Nate. Long overdue, but such a thrill to see it happen at this point in your career. Can that happen to a nicer and more talented person? Oh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, brother. <laughs> that, that means a lot. That really means a lot. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, that's where, it, when you hear it from people who have been kind of in the scene and seen a lot of stuff, that's where it really resonates. So thank you very much for that, Matt. Indeed. Well, I appreciate you, Nate. I'm loving Ken Folk to see the birds. Thank you, Kiana. Tell Thank folks you. once again, you know, where they can get the record. I know it's yeah. probably on all digital platforms. It is. Yeah. It's out on um, 
all the digital platforms it's on edition records um and uh i think that there are still some i'm not sure if we're sold out of vinyl or not but um hopefully we'll have some some physical stuff at this at the shows okay. too um and i'm really looking forward to playing for people um all the upcoming shows i'm very excited about um the portsmouth new hampshire show is almost sold out. We, I think our first set is sold out. We've got a few tickets left for the second one. Nice. Um, and we've got some, you know, DC is selling too. So, you know, let's let's get it. Let's get it. I'm ready to play. Indeed. I'm, really ready, to play. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to play. Great. Well, get in where you fit in, y'all. Hurry up and get these tickets. For sure. In other words, you know, Indeed. act now. Act now. Right. Yeah. Don't say we didn't tell you. Because then right. you're bad. You're bad. <laughs> I didn't know. I had no idea. It's not like you knew. Come on, man. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nate. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. This is a, a delightful conversation. Thank you. Uh, indeed. Yeah. So hopefully I'll see you back here again soon. Oh, coming up on the checkout very soon, Nate Smith makes an appearance there yes. as well with Simon Rentner. Shout out to Simon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Indeed. So yeah. be on the lookout for that as well. Ken Folk to see the birds. Highly recommend it. Definitely add that to your playlist. Thank you. Yourself. Thank you. Indeed. Thanks, Nate. I'll see you soon. See you soon, Kiana. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye bye. And thank you guys so much for joining me here on the Pulse. Be sure to tune in uh, next week for Madison McFerrin. She'll be with me here 8 p.m. Wednesday to talk about her artist curator role with the Brit Jazz Fest. Until next time, you can. Check me on the radio every day, Monday through Friday, 4 to 8 p.m. on Afternoon Jazz. See you next time. Have a great night, and thank you so much for being here, always.